Hi. Hi. We are gathered in one of the hotter tents on the grounds, and we're so happy to be sweating here with you today. How many of you have already been either to the full day workshop we did or one of Brian's workshops? How many of you have already been to one of these? Okay, so we've got a lot of newbies. Um, how many people did write an elevator pitch for this session? You happen to see that online. I see one hand. No, Two hands. More, more. There are more. Three, four. <laughs> oh, so see, now I've got to really figure out how to do this. But I can figure out how to do this. Are you the kind of people, if I brought a mic to you, you would, you would just run out the back of the tent? Okay. <laughs> no, if you wrote a pitch, you're ready. Okay. Um, Here's the way I'd like to suggest we use the time. And again, we've got a really crisp, strict hour. So I thought I would begin with just a bullet list of what I consider, if not best practices, then essentials for the writing life. And of course, it's my writing life. Uh, but I know enough writers to think that at least half the list will speak to at least half of you. Um, so if I can get my phone not to turn off while I'm looking at it, I'll be in great shape. And then the elevator pitch exercise, it would be fun um, to play with that. And though it looked again like, how many hands did you see? Like four. Okay, five. four or five. Then if you're willing, what would be a whole lot of fun would be to come up here and give your pitch. Because essentially, I'll get to that. I'll just hold that exercise. And then I'm going to hand the microphone over to Brian. Because for those of you, even a few of you who try a pitch, what you're trying to do here is gain a follower, right? To, to give a kind of pitch that'll have somebody say, I'd like to hear more about that. And you know what? If you fail miserably at that, you're looking at a person who has preached some sermons that never made it to the first pew, never made it. <laughs> and two things happened. One is um, I, I um, made everybody in the room relax because they have said things like that too that went nowhere. And the other thing is they got to preach the sermon that day themselves. They went out to the parking lot and said, that was really, that sucked. But if I had that text today, I would have said. So I think that's great. You give other people an opportunity. Um, so if you come up a, a, and give a pitch, you may also shoot it right out of the park and you'll have 10 people wanting to buy you know, more immediately. But if you come up here and give your pitch, it would be really fun to talk about that. D does that mean you need something? Okay, that's just excitement in your arms. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes. It was a 100-word pitch for, for, your, for anybody who wanted to play, because I was asked to put something in the printed bulletin for, for the goose. So that's what I thought up that would give us something. But I didn't know how many people would do it. And if you want to get in late and do a couple sentences, it's just the idea is if you were in an elevator, and that's all the length of time you had, was between floors to get someone interested either in um, knowing more about something you, you were interested in or something you've written. And I find elevator pitches very difficult, very difficult. I always want to say, just buy the book. <laughs> but as Brian will tell you, nobody will buy the book if that's all you have to say about it. So that's, that's the idea, you know, is to pitch an idea quickly um, to see if it inspires any interest or not. But that's not the focus of the whole workshop, okay? We've got those three things going on, best practices, pitch time, and then Brian has got three areas um, at which he is expert and at which he can answer questions from those of you who are also pretty, pretty good at social media and, and are active readers and would like to be writers in some way yourselves. Ready to go? Any other questions though like that about this hour? Okay, best practices um, for me. And these are not in any necessary order. It'd be interesting if you wanted to re-rank them somehow. But here's how they came to my mind. Um, it, it seems necessary to me through a long writing life of 30, 40, I won't go any higher than that, years now, um, to have a habit, some habit, a habit of writing is a best practice. And for me, that involves everything you would want if you had a steady meditation practice or if you had a steady fly fishing hobby. But uh, fly fishing, you'd want to stream your equipment, perhaps a partner who could call your family and say you had washed away. You know, but for me, um, a habit means, first of all, a place. Um, and it is a room in my house now. I also have a little uh, writer's cottage in the woods that I built with a little tiny bit of money I got once. 
but it's hot most of the year and cold the rest of the year. So I find I go there less. But a, an established place in my house so that the minute I walk through the door, I start salivating because I know I'm about to get some time in that room. Um, it is um, a place, it's a particular time. I'm a better morning writer. Some people are very early morning writers. Anybody here really early morning? You really do well with sort of monastic hours early up. And some, sometimes that's because they're children or, or elders you're caring for in the house. Other people are owls and late night hours are better. Any of you here? Okay. And then there are a lot of you not raising hands, so guess what? You can write at any time. You can write while you're waiting for a flight at the airport. You can write on index cards. You can write in beautiful little expensive notebooks you keep. You can write on your cell phone. Um, so you can write anywhere. But for me, um, the practice of a habit means a place, a time. I'm usually best from 8 to noon. Um, a medium, and that is for me now a computer but I'm really being drawn to go back to pencil and paper for a while to see what kind of writing that produces and at what speed um, and to you know my standards at what quality. So pencil and paper may about to be making an, a, a reappearance. At, at sometimes the medium has been watercolors and paper and sometimes the, the medium has actually been some, some body exercise before I begin writing to get the feel of things that I want to write about. Um, and then part of the habit is some focus. What am I working on today? It's either a 350 words, I don't care what they're about, it's just something I noticed on the way to the mailbox, or I'm on a deadline and I need 350 words and I'm working on this article, this book, this, this response, this thing. A habit. All of those go to a habit. A place, a time, a medium, and a focus. Um, I do think that the best practice for writing is to have a community. Now that can be as small as one other person, um, a partner. I met somebody here who has an online partner and they simply meet up online, exchange some cordialities, and then they sit there by themselves and write on their computer and exchange what they wrote. Um, and so they don't, they're not geographically limited, but they still have got a writing partner that they have a set time with every week. I could perhaps call community an accountability instead, but that's what I'm getting at. I also know people in writing groups, um, and they are not often all comers groups, like everybody who's interested come to the coffee house. The more successful ones are invited groups, people I know and trust, and I can hear their critique, and I'm willing to offer my critique to them from some depth of knowing them, but you can be the judge of that, depending on where you live. Um, online, uh, as I said earlier, even if it's not just one other person, uh, there are, are certainly writing um, groups that you can set up that way, and Brian will tell you later about some ideas he's got going about online community. Um, and then in the flesh, one of my best um, community partners at one point was just a woman I walked with when I was working on a sermon and she was Sufi so she wasn't Christian and I'd run my sermon idea by her and she was a great one to say things like I don't know what you're talking about or what does that word mean or you know ascension does not have rich significance for me and that didn't mean it was out of the sermon but it meant it was really interesting to know it was blockaded language and then there was my husband who would say things like interesting but not compelling <laughs> A habit, a community of some kind, just one other person for some built-in ac accountability and support, encouragement, and occasional loving critique. Um, an audience, hugely important to think about whose ear you're aiming for, who are your people. Um, when you close your eyes and imagine what you are writing being read by someone, who do you imagine at the other end? Um, and often on Radio, things like, you know, the Protestant hour used to be a big deal. You'd say anybody who's got the radio turned on. But I think for a piece of writing, a tighter focus than that helps. You'll hear this echoed, I think, in the second half of this hour. But to have some idea, for instance, for me, I have for a long time, I did for a long time write exclusively for people initiated into Christian language and, and, and liturgical life. What, it didn't matter what church it was in. but people who had some acquaintance with the uh, professional vocabulary of being Christian. 
Um, when I started writing with a book called Leaving Church, I guess for obvious reasons, I had a different audience in mind, which was churched people, but also people who had left church or were frightened to enter churches for some very good reasons. And I hope that with a title like that, some new readers might pick up something I'd written. So I, I started changing my, my language with that book. Um, I did, however, have a pretty gray-haired audience, at least who showed up for book signings, and bizarrely, that's changing. Always when somebody wanted me to assign a book, they'd say, I'd say, wow, you're reading my book, and they said, no, this is for my granny. You know, would you sign this for my Grammy? So I got, no, this is good. Grandmothers are fabulous readers, and furthermore, guess what? They gave my book to their grandchildren who read the books. So now all of a sudden, wonderfully, I'm also getting some age mix. So now I'm starting to think, you know what? I'm writing to people in their 30s and 40s, as well as people in their 60s and 70s. So the audience changes, but knowing who I hope will pick up the book helps me aim the book as I'm writing, or whatever I'm writing. A habit, a community, an audience. Um, next step is a wound. I, a part of my practice is knowing what I'm struggling with. What is coming up in my life and the lives of my friends often enough that, that it is something I could be in community with other people about? Um, whether it's leaving church, and, and that only means leaving for three weeks, but I'll probably be back. Um, altar in the world, are there only altars in churches? Um, learning to walk in the dark, wait, I thought darkness was bad. Um, holy envy, you know, I'm flying that idea now, but some kind of wound like, um, where is God? You know, is, is communion a movable feast? Uh, does God love Christians best? And then this latest one is, you know, does God play favorites? Uh, and, and I don't consider my answers authoritative. It's why I write in first person. But some kind of shared wound with someone else because that'll keep me engaged in the book and hopefully it'll keep a reader engaged in a work as well. A habit, a community, an audience, a wound. And then a voice, which is a very particular choice um, in, in, as best practice for writing. Um, what is my point of view going to be? Scholarly, intimate, inspirational? Again, I'm starting already. The things you're saying have started to come into my part of the day. I'll be careful here. But for, you know, for whom I'm writing will make a big difference in how do I position myself in my writing. I once heard Mary Oliver say, uh, somebody talked to her about how self-disclosing her poetry was, and she said, oh, that's my formal self. And I thought that was such an interesting thing. She never explained it. But in other words, in her poetry, the I was a curated I to a degree because she kept, she kept some things intimate to herself, personal. Um, as Nadja Boltz Weber has said, Mary Oliver wrote from her scars, not her raw wounds. So it, that's my formal I, my formal self, she said. Um, it also has to do with style. You know, w w what level readers are, are you writing for? If you're writing for an academic or scholarly audience, you can almost look at the books of uh, Marcus Borg and see how an academic begins to write more and more for a popular audience, other people as well. Um, and then the language that I use. More and more, I go for the fewer syllables, not to dumb things down, but both so they're pretty in the ear. Because fewer syllables, people read to themselves while they read. Do you know that? So the prettier the language is, I think, sometimes, the more mellifluous it is. Um, so the, the, the language, the rhetoric, the strategies um, that I take, I have to think a lot about my voice in the book. And often, this changes as I go along. I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> A lineage, by which I mean every time I sit down to write, I remember sort of my adopted ancestors. Who made me want to write in the first place? Who were the writers that made me want to be a writer? And those range from Charles Williams and Madeline Lingle to Annie Dillard powerfully when she came out with Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. Though that writing sounds overblown to me now. You know, it's really interesting what captured my ear at first. John Updike for a while. Then, then a whole slew of new writers like Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou um, and uh, Claudia Rankin. A lot of other writers came in and started to inform my ear. But I call them the Council of Elders to, to know who makes me want to write and keeps me wanting to write. And that perhaps leads um, to the last, which is... I've heard this talked about variously, and at the Goose, I could probably say 
a Holy Spirit, a sacred spirit. I know other people who would call this a muse, but it's important to me always to invite the spirit. Um, that's a habit uh, of a best practice for writing for me is that when I begin, it can be as short as help me, or it can be as short as, and uh, it's a, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert said, she says to her muse, look, if I'm not writing well today, that is not all my fault. I showed up. I am doing my part. And if you think this is not good enough, then show up. Get your butt in here. So, so whatever you call it, I always think it's wonderful to ask for some help. You can say it's from the ancestors, from the Holy Spirit, um, or from the muse. But, but those, are, those are my best practices. Um, a habit, a community, an audience, a wound, a voice a lineage and, and a sacred spirit, a sacred helper, a transcendent uh, spirit that will enliven what I'm doing and, and stop me when I'm going in the wrong direction and, and give me a uh, writer's block long enough to figure out why what I'm trying to write is, is not the direction to go in. And that, you know, if your living writing partners don't do that, your Holy Spirit muse might do that. So my question to you, and you have to really gonna bellow, what did I leave out? What did I leave out that's huge? The descriptors, and I'm not gonna take a, I am, we, we're gonna take a lot of general questions, but I think that's fair. What are my resources? What books do I have around me? And I'm actually getting more and more of those. There's a thesaurus of emotions now, do you know that? That when I'm trying to describe an emotional state, because it's important to me to get that embodied, and I just bought a thesaurus of emotions that give me some suggestions for how that might come into language. But I certainly use a regular computer thesaurus, which is not as rich as my written one used to be, when I had to find it in the page because I would find the entry before and after. But I'm often going there so that red can, though Kate, Rademacher's here and following a red, the red bird is perfect, but sometimes I want scarlet or crimson or rose, you know, and it seems, uh, I notice things like Jesus sometimes says, consider the birds of the air, but other times he says swallows, you know, and I, I think sometimes it's important to say raven or owl and not just bird. So, so as you can tell, it's language, language books that are around me. And then a lot of them are also other writers I read to remind me again how, how I like language to enter the ear. So anything from a, that's a best practice for you that just was left out? Uh, when it's time to step away from this is wonderful, a, a quitting time. And I just learned at this year's Goose that uh, s there are some disciplined writers here who have not only the starting time but the stopping time. And if you're in the middle of a sentence, they say you get up and stop. And part of that is to signal your psyche you're not going to beat it to death today. You know, you're not going to stay in there until, as someone said, you've milked the cow so hard it's milking blood. You know, that's all that's coming out. So I think that's great, a quitting time, to be clear with yourself. Because you do make a contract with your soul when you do this. What else is missing? Great entry. Resources, quitting time. He wants, um, yeah, he's talking about a publisher as well. And all I would say is that if I think about that during my daily time, the critic will come in and shut me down. I mean, my mental critic, my voice of, but, but that is, that is, I'm in the producing stage here, right? In this stage, I'm trying to produce material. Yeah, but it might be there if I'm thinking about my audience. I'm, sh I'm surely thinking about that, but I need not have a publisher in order to do this work or keep this discipline. Does that make sense? It is 20 minutes after the hour, and if I'm gonna do elevator pitch, I wanna be mindful of time. Um, it, who's the bravest person in here to come let other people know what a pitch sounds like? Anybody done one before? You've never done one before. Any, that doesn't disqualify you. Anybody done one before? You have done one before? Well, who, you wanna arm wrestle and see who's up first? Yeah. Uh, no, I saw your hand first. Here is, okay, that's yours. Okay.
this is mine. Here's your job. Just listen. In fact, we're not going to respond. We're going to let her pitch the pitch, and I might ask her how that felt to pitch the pitch, and then you can find her later. But I want to hear a couple pitches so you can hear how they're different. Okay. Take it away. When I was younger, I felt sure that there were answers to all my God and Bible and faith questions in my study Bible in all of its footnotes. But my questions didn't get answered. They didn't always even exist in those footnotes, and I sure didn't hear my voice or my stories in those tiny printed words. So I'm writing my own footnotes, <laughs> not for the whole Bible, that's ridiculous, um, but for the passages in scripture that I wanna love, but that I still have questions about. And I'm putting my MDiv to work for good exegesis and theological commentary, but I'm also putting in my voice and my stories so that I see myself in a book I love. Woohoo! Love it, love it. No, no, sit down. Th this is a, you know what, what I love, once when I was training lectors in a church, I just videotaped them. Nobody said a word, they just watched themselves and sat down and went, okay. You know, so I think right now it's just the experience of that, but I can already see the title, writing my own footnotes. You know, I mean, it's a, that's a lovely pitch. You think? Anything you want to say about it? No, no, no. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. We're not grading. We're enjoying variety here. This is what the goose is all about. I'm an Irish Catholic Episcopalian Republic Democratic Jew who's tired, meaning I'm an American. I mean, who's tired of the way, sick of the way the right has co-opted God. So I went searching for something that I knew was out there, a multi-faith, no faith, and across the political spectrum group of people who were working together. And guess where I found it? In that hot button issue, refugee resettlement. So polarizing in the headlines, so unifying on the ground. And in The Stranger Among You, I write about the way people from the left and the right, Trump voters, Clinton voters, non-voters, are working together, particularly in the Bible Belt and red states, representing that, the revival of that old movement, the religious left. Hey! <laughs> what I love about that pitch is it started out in my ear one way and ended another way, which is here's something we can get together on. I mean, it, that's it, because she started out with her sort of, what, staking out her territory and then it ended up being about how to, how to come together. So another, another kind of pitch. Anything you want to say? Okay. And we'll do about four of these unless somebody's saying, no, no, I worked so hard on mine. Now I've second guessed myself based on the first two. <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Jerome Libba, and I am a white African American refugee kid from Congo. And I was raised in both the church and the clinical setting in what I refer to as the shallow end. Uh, life put me in the deep end, and I ended up with a profound amount of questions. Uh, so because I couldn't find a good doctor, I became one. And in the process of reconciling my history as both a patient and a doctor, a doubter and a believer, one of the things that I ended up doing was creating the first brain-based model for the Enneagram, uh, which is completely founded in neuroscience and allows people to transition from reductive and weaponized versions of personality typologies to holistic identity profiles, allowing them to practically and realistically move towards wholeness and wellness. He did that without notes. That's I'd like serious. to point out. <laughs> so I'm noticing two things. Do you hearing the self descriptions that come up at the beginning of these, which is pretty interesting, pretty good way to grab people. You know, it's like, here are my five adjectives. This, this is me and describes me. So I've heard that in all three in a way. Here, here's, here's, here's the me you're hearing from in this pitch. And the, and the only thing I'd say about yours is you got to go for six floors. So, uh, so, you know, some of you, and, and that's my problem, is if they get on with me in the basement, they got to hang to the 12th floor. I can't get done. So, but, but everything... That, that's good. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful if somebody, if their floor came and they said, I can't get out yet. I'll ride up with you and I'll ride back down. That's a wonderful way. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, look. Okay. Yeah, come on up because a front row. And I'm going to watch the time, which means I've got another idea in a minute. <laughs> 
Elijah is the act of contracting words, removing the unnecessary while maintaining the meaning and worth of a word. It results in informality and familiar conversation. The Latin root elidere means literally to crush out. It's a bit violent. Elidere is a theological and emotional resource blog by a married gay disowned Southern Baptist preacher's daughter for those attempting the usually painful, sometimes violent, but always beautiful work of reconstruction. Those attempting to crush a new faith out of an old and crushing religion. These are impressive. It's, it's amazing how quickly you get the, right, get the idea. Who else? You know, there's so many of you now, listen, what should I do? What, oh, oh and you're really being athletic back there, so that was either to cool off or you really want to. Come on up, yeah. We've got five more minutes. I'm gonna run pitches for five more minutes, is that okay? Huh? So I'm gonna do this one and one more. And then your assignment, if you wrote one, I would stop the whole show and get you to pitch your neighbor, but instead I'm going to say you got to pitch somebody before you walk out of this tent at one. At two. Why would a man, a seminary graduate, professor of religion, teacher of ethics, pastor, husband, father, little league coach, commit without obvious cause the most brutal of murders? And then, before being discovered, console the family of the victim that he knew and preach her funeral. This nonfiction book, you can find the answer to those questions in this nonfiction book, Beyond Belief, the true story of a brutal murder and the man and the minister who committed it. <laughs> Somebody just said, is it you? <laughs> no. <laughs> but, uh, but I do know the man and, and interviewed him in, prison, in central prison for 200 hours. So. Good grief. There's a bestseller. <laughs> now, wasn't that interesting? Yeah, because the self-descriptors were in there, but he began with a question. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Why would? Yeah. Uh, you want to be the last one? Anybody wants to follow that is welcome. <laughs> and, and maybe I'll, yeah, I might, I can't seem to quit. These are too much fun. Are you coming up with him? Hot dog. On the day of, on the day of Columbine, my algebra teacher may, mocked my speech impediment. Uh, a few weeks earlier, the social studies teacher, um, after giving a presentation on the Eightfold Path, said, did, Michael, did you say white? or white. And then for the rest of the school year, um, in a half African American school, people were pumping their fists at me saying white power. Huh. Not even on the Eightfold Path. Um, I, every day people would call me gay or retarded or ask about what country I was from. Um, I couldn't reconcile this with my fundamentalist evangelical faith and the empathy and sense of justice I learned um, shook my faith in ways I could never have imagined. Wow. 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 Cool. I haven't been keeping strict track, but could we end with a woman? Got a woman pitch here? Yeah? Come on up. You were so, you, you raised your hand. Don't so look terrified. I called on you. <laughs> I'm so nervous. Okay, <laughs> just gonna, okay. Okay, how can I be so thankful and so pissed at God at the same time? I asked my therapist in tears, how does your body have space for such big and conflict, conflicting emotions? In my journey, I've learned that Jesus sets up a feast of thankfulness on the shore of the sea of despair. The pain teaches us and gratitude is our landmark to guide us on the journey. For all our pictures heard and unheard. All of you, those were great. Okay. Yeah. Your hour. Okay. If you, cool. see, if you see anybody else who's got a pitch. You can pitch him to give your pitch. This, I'm going to turn the tent over to Brian now. <laughs> that was awesome. That was such a good idea, Barbara. I think that was really great, great material out there. So thank you for that. Um, so first of all, let me ask a couple questions. 
how many of you read a book by Barbara Brown Taylor? Oh, please. Okay. How many have not read Holy Envy? Oh, that's nice. Please go buy it. If you want to read a really good book, I, I highly recommend it. Just don't ask me to pitch it. <laughs> okay. Okay, next question. How many people have read a book by Brian Elaine? That's because they don't exist. <laughs> Brian Elaine's never written a book. So why is Brian Elaine at the stage talking about best practices for writers? Right? Good question, right? So let me give you a quote that I heard uh, not long ago from the CEO of a Christian publishing house. He said, 15 years ago, all I cared about was the quality of the writing. Now I don't even look at the writing unless they have a platform. Okay? So that's one man's opinion, but it's indicative of the sea change that has happened within spiritual writing. So 15 years ago, I, there was no reason for me to be up here with Barbara, right? She's the writer. I'm not. I'm the business guy. But the way the world has changed now, building a platform, and when people use the word platform, all they really mean is a following. <clears throat> you know, some group of people who care about what you have to say. Right, and, and that can take all kinds of different forms, whether you know, it's megachurch pastor, podcaster, social media, whatever. Okay, so, but the point is that for a publisher to be able to invest in you, they only have a small number of books that they do per year. And most of those books are taken up by people like Barbara who have already proven that they can sell lots of books. So each year they make a bet on someone new, you know, a small number of new writers. And so that's an important bet for them. And they want to find someone who's not only a good writer, but also has a following, right? So <clears throat> um, game changer, completely different than, you know, many years ago where a writer's job was to produce the manuscript, throw it over the wall, and the publisher took care of everything else, right? No longer the way that it works. So th that's some of the bad news. Um, <clears throat> some of the good news is that with the advent of the Internet, you now have the ability to reach your customers, your audience, your people directly. You do not need to go through a gatekeeper. Gatekeeper, i.e. publishing house, magazine, you know, uh, television station, radio, whatever, you know, the previous forms of media used to be. You can now build your own following directly yourself. Really powerful, really good news. But again, they're bad news. Everyone's doing, trying to do the same thing, right? So how do you get above the noise? Right? That's the key issue now in terms of becoming an established author. And again, I'm not talking about somebody who's you know, already there. I'm talking about someone who's relatively new trying to break through. <clears throat> so kind of the strategic aspect of, um, of finding your niche, finding your audience is extremely important. And you know, I, I, uh, we have like a day-long version of this that we did the other day. So I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on some of this stuff. My recommendation is to find a very narrow niche that you can become known for. It doesn't have to be a big, you know, mass market kind of a thing on day one, but at least something that's got some amount of size, you know, critical mass in terms of an audience where you can become the go-to person. And so let me give a couple examples of, uh, you know, things that I think have, you know, been recently done that uh, exemplify this. It's really a good idea to, th to pick an intersection of two markets. So, for instance... There's a woman that came out with a book a couple years ago called The Spirituality of Wine, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an overlap between faith and wine, right? So it's kind of an interesting little niche, right? And you can imagine your, your book tour being wine tasting events too, right? So, I mean, what's not to like about that? There's another book that came out by a pastor in Massachusetts by the name of Reverend Laura Everett. It's called Holy Spokes, S-P-O-K-E-S. -E so it's a, she's a really avid bicycling person and a pastor, right? So her first book was about that overlap between those two areas. So just a couple of examples. And at our last Writing for Your Life conference, we had somebody pitch a book. She had just finished a PhD in medieval literature and she was a roller derby queen. And, and her book that she pitched, and see, your pitches were doing this. Did you hear how your pitches were aiming towards your audience as well as self-definition? But hers was what I relearned about Jesus from, playing, from being a roller derby queen. I mean, I want to read it already, so. 
Yeah, I mean, so the, the, I think the uh, opportunities for niches are endless, right? I mean, you know, the, we've heard some really great ones, you know, here already today. But having that kind of a narrow focus is just a, extremely important for someone getting started. Okay, so now let's say you've, you've got that. Okay, you found your niche. You really can focus on that. What do you do next? So how do you build that platform? How do you build that following? And um, I like to use this analogy. Again, I'm a business guy, so I apologize for using. There's a thing called a sales funnel, which you know kind of starts at the high level and works its way down to ultimately consummate in a sale is the idea. At the top of the funnel, it's based in like three stages. At the top of the funnel, all you're trying to do is create awareness. Right, let people know who in the world you are, what in the world you have to offer them. So again, remember your number one, again, recommendation, number one objective in writing a book is to help people in that niche that you've identified. So how am I helping people? So you wanna create awareness of how you can help them. So in today's world, and I'm gonna use some generalizations here, so there's exceptions to everything that I'm saying, but in today's online world, the best way to attract new people, make them aware of you, is Facebook and Twitter. Okay, now, if you have a particularly young audience, then Instagram is really important. Um, if you have a very visual audience, like for things around fashion or cooking, then Pinterest is really interest, uh, is important. If you have a business-to-business -business more focused, then LinkedIn is, so, so it kind of varies a little bit, right? You know, but generally speaking, to create awareness for the first time, Facebook and Twitter are the best. To bring people to the second stage, you want to use those awareness things to get them to go to your website, to get them to read your blog, to get them to subscribe to your email. So the number one thing that publishers look at in terms of assessing a person's following is how many email subscribers do they have, right? So you can't just start with trying to collect email addresses because you know nobody's gonna know who you are. So you have to start with the awareness, get them to Subscribe to your email, read your blog, go to your website, so that you can build a relationship with those folks. They begin to trust you. They begin to get to know you. And then finally, stage three, hopefully they'll buy your book. Or maybe someone who runs a conference will be so excited about your work that they will invite you to come speak at a conference. I mean, one of the things that's another important aspect of a writing career these days is that you don't make a living just by writing books. Right, I mean, the, just the, 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 the economics of that are just not as lucrative as they used to be. And you also, you know, it, it's really good to find other areas like speaking or consulting or editing or teaching that complement your writing so that they feed off each other. And I've met quite a few people here um, blogging's as far as they want to go. They're not interested in a book eventually. A lot of people are, but I would point out that funnel works as well if my end goal is I want regular readers of my blog. Is that fair? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Or if you're self-published, you know, if you're, if you're just, you know, publishing yourself, you still need the platform. You still need the same, you know, trajectory. Um, and because he's, he is the computer, he knows all the stuff he's talking about. All I know is paper. But here's the great thing about paper. I've also seen people here handing out cards, and it's got their picture on the front and their blog on the back, or the name of their new book on the back. And these are showing up more and more, and they're very interesting. You know, if only because there are going to be some people who relate to that and save that in ways that they can't find anything on their computers anymore. So, so it's a new thing I'm seeing that's effective on me, at least. Go. So just one kind of into the weeds from a tactical perspective yet, you've probably, you know, all been posting either on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere. The most effective format for posting online is what's called a meme, M-E-M-E. -E. And all it is is an image with a small amount of text overlaid on top of it. And the reason why that's effective is because it's shared the most. People pass them around. I'm sure you've all seen them, right? So. For your own work, for your own area of focus, to the extent that you can find an image matched to a small amount of text that you've written that tie together, and then add your name or your domain name, your URL, so, so that people, as the thing gets shared, they know who it's from. So, you know, video is good, blog articles are good, do those too. But this thing about a meme turns out to be, you know, the most shareable form of online content. So, um, it's, and they're easy to create. There's tools that you can use to do this. The one I use is called Canva, C-A-N-V-A. It's free. 
Um, there's all kinds of repositories of free images so that you can use photographs that are you know, permitted for you to be able to use. So there's all kinds of different ways that you can create these things. So now you have find your niche, you've built your platform, now you want to get published. <coughs> um, getting a traditional publisher you know, to go with you, particularly as a first time author, is you know, the best way to go, right? I mean, because there's all kinds of great publishing companies out there. However, I've heard of statistics from three different publishing companies that have told me that on average, with all the book proposals that they receive in a year, roughly 1% turn into a book. Right, so what have you ever done before that you had a you know one percent chance of success? It's the point is that it's really difficult to get a publisher to publish your book. But the good news side of that story is that do-it-yourself publishing, also known as self-publishing, has never been better. The tools are really good. The economics are really good. The quality of the book that comes out at the end after you've done that is extremely high. So if you can't get a traditional publisher or choose not to, just know that do-it-yourself publishing is a really viable way to go. And if you think about it, okay, if I've got to build my own platform, if I've got to do my own marketing, why do I need a publisher anyway? You have to ask that question. Right now, again, I'm not trying to tell you that self-publishing is the way to go. I'm just saying, think about it. Has anybody in here done that yet, taken the self-publishing route? See, this is very interesting. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, I've, I've learned a lot about that from Brian and from participants here who've taken that route. I have a friend named Rashid Nuri who uh, does urban gardening in Atlanta in neighborhoods that have been food deserts. And he wrote a book, has a website, put his book on the website, and he called me and said, Barbara, I've never done this. I need help. The books are selling like crazy. And he said, like, where do I sign my name now that I'm selling signed copies of the book? But it's going on Amazon where I think his royalties are 95% or something. I mean, Amazon only takes what? Well, I mean, it depends on which distribution channel within okay. Amazon that you go to. But on average, the dollars per book that you'll get by do-it-yourself publishing are roughly four or five times as much as what you would get through a traditional publisher. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's about money, but it is a lot about the gatekeepers Brian was talking about because Rashid also called me and said, could you introduce me to a traditional publisher? I said, why? You know, why when you've got readers? I mean, there may be a time later, but what he's found is he had a platform. He's, he's a guy my age. He's, he's got an elder. He's got a reputation. He's got a book that's selling that hadn't even been released to Amazon yet. So, so again, as Brian said, this used to be called vanity publishing, and it is not anymore. It is a way that voices that couldn't get you know, past that 99% rate at a big publisher can get into print. And as Brian has said in more detail, and we'll also let you in on, on his website, Writing for Your Life, um, there, there are ranks of publishers. There are smaller publishers. You don't have to have an agent you know, to get somebody. There's a book acquisition editor right down at Westminster John Knox Tent. You know, so there, there are ranks of publishers as well, should you be interested in that. But I, but I do love for this not to f for you to feel like you're being pressed towards book publishing, though it's not as hard as you might have thought. But also, you know, if my first list held up at all, you're thinking about your readers. I just realized your question about publisher is really a reader. You want a publisher to believe you have readers, right? That you've got something to say. And as Brian has always phrases it, you've got some help to offer. Um, so any, any way you can offer your help will make the world a better place. Do you want to do Q&R? Yeah, Did let's you get do that. So um, what I'll do is up at the front here, after we're, we're done, I'll leave some copies of a handout uh, about writing for your life, as well as some bookmarks. So help yourself to that. But yeah, let's open it up to questions. Uh, did you get done? Questions. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and yeah. people can ask you questions. Yeah, we'll too, stick so. around afterwards too. Oh, so. really? Gee, okay, we've got five minutes. Yes. So I have a bit. Uh, ha ha. Thank you. So I have a question about being a gay author. Essentially, um, I am very proud of my sexuality. Uh, I've said repeatedly I define myself as an Angian because Angie is my wife and she's all I want. But I, I love everybody and I want to speak to everybody. And though I do think that my sexuality is a crucial part of who I am, I worry and fear about getting pigeonholed in spiritual writing by mentioning that I'm gay in something like a pitch. Yeah. 
So because I, it's so hard. I I think a lot of straight people who are like super well intended and really excited to learn from somebody different from them think, oh well, I'm just going to learn about the LGBTQIA, etc. Um, group of people like this is for them and I'm just kind of like dropping in but it's it's not it's about theology so how do I deal with that is that a valid fear Brian is the guy to answer your question but let me point out that could be southern writer woman writer black writer activist writer so she's asking a question for a lot of people okay okay so here's my thoughts on that remember I said earlier to pick a narrow niche you know when you first get started that doesn't mean you have to stay in that niche forever, okay? I was ho hopefully not misleading people on that. Once you have a, a following, once you have a beachhead, once you've published a couple of books, you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, Barbara, anything that Barbara would write, we would all read because we know it's going to be phenomenal, right? Investment. <laughs> Advice, no. Nah. I would still buy it. I would still read it. <clears throat> Out of curiosity, if nothing else. But <laughs> So my advice to you is don't, shy away from that narrowness on day one of, of uh, identifying yourself. Um, for one thing, from a publisher's perspective, you know, there are some publishers who will want to actively um, pursue, you. pursue you. There's others who will run away like, you know, crazy. They're going to find out one way or the other, so you might as well not try to hide it from them. And back to the kind of narrowness of your niche, to get started, I think it's a good idea to identify yourself. We got time for one more, and then I don't think Brian or I are going to run away, we'll, but we have to vacate the tent. Awesome. Um, when creating a, a narrow niche, uh, if the niche is so narrow that it's, it's unfamiliar to most of the people, for instance, I work in the world of neurotheology, and I create content that if you Google it, three total results come up on Google, and two of them are mine. Right, so I don't know if anybody else can Google anything that comes up with three results, but it's pretty hard. So trying to figure out how to on-ramp people into something that is quasi-academic, quasi-practical, I guess the question is, when you're introducing something that is quintessentially niche and almost too narrow, what is the best way to on-ramp somebody to introduce them to it, but still to make it practical for them so they can engage? Well, I mean, I, I think the, um, the first answer to that I would come in is, is the type of language that you use. You know, you really want to use, I'll use the word layperson's language as opposed to academic language. So you make it access, accessible, uh, not just your book, but also all your marketing, right? You know, to make it something that people can easily grasp. And, I mean, the bad, one of the pieces of bad news about online marketing is that you only have a nanosecond right, to get someone's attention. So that's this whole idea of a meme that I was talking about. You want to immediately capture someone's attention with like an emotional connection, if you can, with that image and with those words. So, you know, you, in your particular case, you've got to, I hate to say this, dumb it down at some level, right, you know, to make it very succinct to get the point across quickly. But almost everyone that I talk to, they fail by being too broad as opposed to too narrow. So I... Don't worry about the narrowness. And what I think of instead of, uh, I mean, dumbing down, point well made, because dumb is one syllable. But it's also remove the language barriers. Remove yeah. the language yeah. barriers. And I think you can do that in your meme, you know, as well. You know, I can see a question mark already or so-and-so for, for ordinary. It's sort of a variation on the so-and-so for dummies, yeah. you know, which was that's, a wonderful way of dumbing Absolutely. down. It, yeah, it, yeah. it owned that phrase. So um, how are we on time? We're done. Okay. One more? Who's got a one, one more question? Who's got a thirty second question with a thirty second answer? Then thank you so much. Okay, we got one more. No, she's picking it up. I just want to know what uh, what was your favorite book that you've read in the last year? Both of us? Come on, you have the great answer. Okay, so I just finished a book while I've been here called Where Good Ideas Come From. Uh, since I'm, you know, heavily into innovation and thinking about launching new things, that's an important topic for me. So I, I just loved it. And I'm reading Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, what is it called? Thank you so much, because I've loved everything she's written, and she keeps changing the voice she's writing in. So that I'm, I'm reading Elizabeth Gilbert's latest novel. You are wonderful. It is hot. Thank we you. We got to vacate the tent, but we'll be over there. Thank you. <laughs>